Attenborough, no less. And uh, he's had a very successful career in the UK home civil services. He wrote a great deal of comic drama and review and composed many song lyrics. And very dear to the Pakistani heart, he has played cricket for many different teams in over 20 countries for over 60 years and continues to do so, although now in the twilight of a career. <laughs> and he has, he's a slow medium bowler who moves the ball both ways off the bat. <laughs> he also enjoys playing the piano badly. <laughs> So that's Richard Heller, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome him. Uh, thank you very much, Lynette, and thank you, uh, thank you for stepping in again at uh, short notice. Uh, I'll just test this microphone for a moment. Uh, just get the right level. Um, I used to dream that I'd discover the perfect lover one day. That was a test. Who, who wrote those words? Who wrote those words? Pretty easy answer. Who wrote those words? Come on, who are we, who are we here to talk about today? Peter, Peter Woodhouse. Woodhouse. Peter yeah. Woodhouse was a great lyricist in, uh, amongst his many other abilities. He wrote, and to give you an idea of what a good lyricist he was, his main collaborator was Jerome Kern. Um, Jerome Kern is a very, very demanding songwriter, composer, particularly, particularly if you're a bad pianist like me. Um, Jerome Kern uh, has a lot of very, very tricky passages. Um, just look at, uh, do, do anybody here know Smoke Gets In Your Eyes? Yes. <laughs> right. The middle passage of Smoke Gets In Your Eyes is a nightmare to pianists and singers. So if you could work with Jerome Kern as a lyricist, you really were the bee's knees. Um, PG um, actually wrote his lyrics in a, some would say in a difficult way because he, he wanted the music written first and he actually fitted all his lyrics to already established music, um, which makes it very remarkable that they're so fluent um, in my view, um, particularly because Again, Jerome Kern was very demanding. He writes a lot of, a lot of his songs are very short phrases, so you don't have a great deal to work with as a lyricist, but PG's flow very, very well. Um, PG Woodhouse, as we know, is a very prolific writer, and I wonder if anybody here would like to take a guess at the number of published words uh, that he wrote. A word count for his whole published work. Just take a guess at random. Anybody? One? Higher, higher, as they say. Keep going. Um, one? Uh, um, we're going up from one million. Go up from one million. More? No idea. Oh, no more? No more. By my calculation, um, PG published 12 million words in his lifetime. Um, he, uh, and to put that into perspective, there are roughly 600,000 words in War and Peace in English. So he wrote 24 War and Pieces. Um, a somebody said a million. A million is a roughly the number of words in the complete Harry Potter sequence. So P.G. Woodhouse in his lifetime wrote um, 12 Harry Potters. 12, 12 complete Harry Potter sequences. Um, 71 novels, 24 collections of short stories, 43 plays, 15 movie scripts, though he wasn't, as we know, he wasn't very happy in Hollywood. Um, seven miscellaneous autobiographies, collections of letters, and that kind of thing. So 160 published books in a collection, making by, just by my estimate about um, 12 million words. As, we, as you I'm sure you know, he went on writing um, until his death uh, at the age of 93. He was still at work at a novel. I think it was, well, it was one published posthumously. Um, and um, as I think you all know, he wrote all his novels on a manual 
typewriter. Tick, 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 tick. Um, and I think there's a very good academic thesis to be written sometime on the way writing technology has transformed writing. Um, PG was a meticulous craftsman. The fact that it's become easier, I don't know, I don't think PG would ever have used a word processor, even if they'd been around in his time. It was very important to him to um, think and write at the same time, and that's what a manual typewriter does for you. It slows you down and makes you look at your work as you're going along. And as we all know, PG was an absolutely meticulous craftsman. There's really never a word out of place. And I think that was helped by seeing your words come up slowly on a page on an electric typewriter rather than gushing out on a word processor as they, as they do now. And I don't know if you have a feeling about this, um, Annette, but I'm, I'm sure novels are getting longer just because the novelist can churn the damn stuff out. I mean, this, this novel of mine got much too thick because of the word processor. If I'd had the discipline of a, a typewriter, it would have been shorter. Anyway, um, I've spoken about P.G. Woodhouse in Pakistan a few times. The, um, I wondered what sort of audience I'd get the first time. Uh, and I thought, surely there can't be many Pakistanis who are interested in an English writer writing about a very arcane form of English life. Um, very few people ever lived like P.G. Woodhouse's characters in, in, in England, even when he was writing about them. Um, and I was very surprised for my first audience to see a lot of young people. Um, but um, then I thought afterwards, no. Um, People like P.G. Woodhouse, they don't want a slice of life when they read P.G. Woodhouse. They're not, you're not reading P.G. Woodhouse as a social document. Thank you so much, of English life. Um, you read P.G. because you enter into um, an immaculately constructed fantasy world in which um, characters behave extravagantly, but with great discipline by the conventions that um, P.G. sets for them. And um, um, it's like a club that you enter. There's no restrictions on entry. Um, you don't have to be put down as a member. You don't have to pay a fee. You can just enter PG as a club. And so long as you accept the rules of the club, you can, um, you can enjoy all the facilities, um, whatever you like. Um, PG, wrote, PG Woodhouse himself wrote about his technique well, he actually said two things about his technique. One of them was wrong and one of them was right. The thing that I think, a famous quote that he said about his writing, is he said, it's, he said, it's a series of spasms, you know, as if it was something uncontrolled. Um, it may have been a spasm in the sense that he couldn't resist writing, that he loved writing, which is true, um, and he carried his, electric, his, carried his portable typewriter with him almost everywhere. Um, he had it with him even when he was interned, as we know, during the <clears throat> war by the Germans, and he went on typing. He, he went on typing sometimes at social occasions, you know, when he got bored, um, and there was something, he just, he'd walk away with his typewriter and do some more work. Um, but his writing isn't a, a spasmodic effort at all. It's a very controlled and meticulous one. So the second thing he said about his work is, um, I think this is true, is this. I believe there are two ways of writing successful novels. One is mine, making the thing frankly a fairy story and ignoring real life altogether. The other is going right deep down into life and not caring a damn. Now I think um, P.G. Woodhouse created a, fairy, a series of fairy stories a series of fantasy worlds, but it, with such precision and craftsmanship and discipline that um, um, they're very easy to enter and accept and enjoy. And they gave him great opportunities to write um, expressively and colorfully uh, because the, the characters are all, you can create very extravagant characters because they're all anchored in this, um, Foundation. No, you don't anchor th 
Excuse me, you don't anchor things in a foundation. PG would have hated that. They're all set in a foundation, which is um, rock solid. Um, I want to speak first, uh, dwell first on um, P.G. Woodhouse's Smith novels, Smith with a, a P. So I think they mark a very important transition in his work. Um, the, um, Smith is, until he, Smith came into his work, P.G. Woodhouse is a very successful writer of schoolboy fiction. And he might have stayed with, he loved writing schoolboy fiction, particularly about cricket. Um, he had a conversation with George Orwell about his work after the war, and they both talked about his cricket novels more than anything else, because P.G. Woodhouse enjoyed them so much. But Smith comes in and uh, into them. <coughs> Smith comes in for the first time. He meets P.G. Woodhouse's hero, Mike, at his fictional public school, Sedley. And he asks immediately, he says what I think is one of the most significant sentences P.G. Woodhouse ever wrote. He asks Mike, are you the bully, the pride of the school, or the boy who is led astray and takes to drink in chapter 16? <coughs> and here he is making fun of his own work, the conventions of his own work. Um, it's a sign that he's going to strike off in a completely different direction. He's going to start writing comedy and satire. Um, and with the Smith novels, might start this established hero takes second place. Smith, um, who's his first really extravagant, over-the-top character, takes over the narrative completely. Um, Smith um, is... Um, begins the narration, begins the stories by proclaiming himself a radical socialist. He says, it's a great scheme. You work for the equal distribution of property and start by collaring all you can and sitting on it. Um, that's his philosophy and he is actually, Smith is an anarchist um, and his whole mission is subverting authority. And at his school, Smith achieves this by effortlessly patronizing all the masters. Um, if you've read conventional you know, English school fiction, or any school fiction, you know that, or indeed had this experience yourself, you know that a, a trip to the headmaster's study is a frightening experience, usually. But um, Smith makes it a social call. Um, and he patronizes the headmaster. And eventually, um, uh, um, when he's had enough of the headmaster, he says, may I go now, sir? I am in the middle of a singularly impressive passage of Cicero's speech, De Senectute. And the headmaster says, I am sorry that you should leave your preparation till Sunday, Smith. It is a habit of which I altogether disapprove. And Smith says, I am reading it, sir, for pleasure. <laughs> um, I tried this routine on my headmaster in my time, the only time that I was summoned to the headmaster's study. But unfortunately, he was a P.G. Woodhouse fan as well, and he knew, and he knew what I was up to. Um, in the next three Smith novels, um, we move away from the school setting once and for all. Um, the next one is based on P.G. Woodhouse's experiences um, as a downtrodden bank worker. Um, and he put, the, put a lot of the uh, toiling away in the Hong Kong and Shanghai bank, uh, and as uh, Mike and Smith are sent to, to a bank to work in Smith in the city. Um, and um, Smith, again, is an anarchist in the city, and he spends most of his time not doing any work, but annoying <coughs> their superior, uh, Mr. Bickersdyke. Um, it's um, important for one... Um, uh, uh, Smith and City has a foretaste of um, something that... Um, a technique that P.G. Woodhouse would apply particularly to Bertie Wooster, which is writing about his hero in the third person. Good effect. Um, and it's where you get the phrase, 
Smith says. The cry goes round the clubs. Smith is baffled. Um, and then in the third novel, which I'm Smith novel, I'm particularly fond of, because I've been a journalist. Smith, journalist. Um, the two of them are now in New York, um, uh, where PG himself spent a lot of his life um, as a hack writer and as a lyricist. Um, it's a, one of P.G. Woodhouse's most realistic novels. He writes about quite serious social issues like, um, um, like uh, slum housing um, and racketeering and, and crime. Um, but the main feature of his novel is that Smith takes over a, an American magazine, and there are a lot of them around in those days. It's quite excruciatingly dull. Um, it's, um, it's called Cozy Moments, and it's a family magazine in which everything offensive or controversial has been possibly has been removed. And Smith turns it into a muckraking journal, you know, exposing scandal, and um, <coughs> um, and uh, it's it, it's basically he turns it into a uh, what's called a yellow newspaper. Um, and he does uh, exposing scandal and muckraking and crime, and um, in particular, there's a, a um, he introduces a, a boxing column, um, and um, Smith achieves this, and he gives this newspaper a wonderful motto: "Cozy moments will not be muzzled." Um, finally, I've always wanted to have my own newspaper, and if I ever did my own journal, and that's what I'd call it. It would be cozy moments, and it would, be, and it would not be muzzled. And finally, in the last of them, uh, Leave It to Smith, the last Smith novel, P.G. Woodhouse, um, the, the pair have left Cambridge. Um, Smith has very briefly been forced to take up conventional employment um, in a very unappealing business, wholesale fish belonging to his uncle. Um, and eventually, he doesn't last long there, and he sets out his own stall. Um, uh, and he offers his own services to anybody who will take them. And, a very, and here's another very characteristic P.G. Woodhouse technique. He writes, composes a very long, small ad, personal ad. Smith will help you. Smith is ready for anything. Do you want someone to handle your business? Do you want someone to take the dog for a run? Someone to assassinate your aunt? Smith will do it. Crime not objected to. Whatever job you have to offer, provided it has nothing to do with fish, leave it to Smith. And very characteristic um, uh, uh, technique of Woodhouse's that will recur over and over again verbosity in a very small space. It's usually a telegram. Telegrams in P.G. Woodhouse's are of immense length um, and usually repeated. You know, there's a long telegram and somebody say, what you mean? And somebody say, you send another telegram back saying, you ass, of course I meant all of them. And there's another long telegram. Um, anyway, this novel is more complexly plotted than the previous three and it introduces a lot of characters that we're going to meet again particularly um, the cast of Blanding's Castle. Lord Emsworth, his tyrannical sister Constance, um, his appalling ally, the efficient Baxter, his irritating son, Freddy. Um, the only thing missing from this Blanding's Castle is the Empress of Blanding's, the prize pig. Um, he hadn't discovered, PG hadn't discovered the um, comic possibilities of the Empress yet. So Lord Emsworth loves flowers instead. He potters around his garden, um, gardening all the time. Um, this novel has, a reg has another regular theme uh, of P.G. Woodhouse's, imposters. Um, Blanding's Castle, in particular, is at, uh, novel after novel, it's crawling with imposters. People sneak into the castle under false pretenses, and as Smith does, impersonating a poet. Um, um, and um, P.G. Woodhouse hated poets, um, so poets are always, um, um, uh, he hated high culture generally. High culture is always, um, you know, game for mockery in all the novels, and P. Smith impersonates a highbrow poet. Um, 
to digress for a minute, my favorite imposter, P.G. Woodhouse, is the, the Earl of Ickenham. And he sneaks into Blanding's castle, can't go in under his own name, and he sneaks in um, pretending to be Sir Roderick Glossop, the, um, the nerve specialist, the psychiatric therapist. And, um, um, or as P.G. Woodhouse calls him, the loony doctor. Um, and unfortunately for the Earl of Ickenham, the real Sir Roderick Glossop is traveling up on the same train. And somebody um, uh, confronts the fake um, Sir Roderick Glossop and says there's somebody calling himself. There's another Sir Roderick Glossop on the train. And he pretends brilliantly, the fake Roderick Glossop pretends that the real one is one of his patients. Um, pretending to be him, the real Sir Roderick Glossop. Sorry, that was a bit of a digression. So you have a sort of multiple layer of impostorship um, going on there. Um, and um, anyway, PG, um, that's... Uh, as an impostor, Smith penetrates Blanding's castle and uh, secures a series of multiple happy endings, including one for himself, and he then um, disappears from the, um, then disappears from P.G. Woodhouse's work. P.G. Woodhouse is often asked why he never wrote another Smith novel, and he said, I actually couldn't think of another one. He couldn't think of another plot for him. So um, um, he disappears, and um, we then, but we've now, with the Smith novels, in my view, P.G. Woodhouse has now established his metier um, as a fantasy novelist. He's um, uh, a constructor of fantasies. He's constructed Blanding's Castle um, as one of the settings of his fantasies. And we're in a world now where the real world outside hardly ever intrudes at all. Um, we never... Almost nobody in P.G. Woodhouse has been in the Great War, has had any involvement in the Great War at all. Um, uh, almost nobody in P.G. Woodhouse does a real job. Um, that said, um, P.G. Woodhouse produced a great satire on the British fascist leader of the 30s, Sir Oswald Mosley. Um, uh, he, he, P.G. Woodhouse turned him into Sir Roderick Spode. Um, Roderick's always a very menacing name in P.G. Woodhouse. Um, Mosley created the black shirts in the 1930s in Britain, but Spode um, can't afford black shirts, so he equips his followers in, in black shorts. Um, and, and he has a memorable confrontation with Bertie Wooster. Um, and Bertie um, is amazed to discover that, um, you know, Spode thinks that black shorts are appropriate dress for a political movement. And he gives Spode a very powerful character reading. The trouble with you, Spode, is that because you've succeeded in inducing a handful of halfwits to discover, the, to disfigure the London scene by going about in black shorts, you think you're someone. You hear them saying, Heil Spode, and you think it's the voice of the people. That is where you make your bloomer. What the voice of the people is saying, look at that frightful ass Spode swanking about in footer bags. Did you ever in your puff see such a perfect perisher? Um, but that's a rare excursion um, by P.G. Woodhouse into real life, particularly into political life. And most of the action in P.G. Woodhouse's great novels occurs in private places, not public ones, usually characters' homes. Um, either sometimes they're great estates, and sometimes they're um, just tumble-down cottages, suburban villas, tumble-down cottages, and of course clubs. Um, and it was a great touch of P.G. Woodhouse's to make London's liveliest club <clears throat> the, Lon the drones um, migrate to London's stuffiest club, the Senior Conservative Club, and to throw bread rolls at the sleeping regulars. Um, and 
by cutting off his main characters from, in my view, from dreary realities, P.G. Woodhouse could let rip on their personalities. Um, and um, he could give them immense, very, very colorful dialogue and behaviors um, because uh, those dialogues and that dialogue and behaviors was, um, becomes natural and predictable in the world that he creates. And just for example, um, there are very, almost no parental relationships in um, P.G. Woodhouse's novels, and nearly all the parents de described in P.G. Woodhouse's novels regard their children as a perfect pest, and they're very glad to get rid of them. Um, collateral relationships are much more important, uncles and aunts. P.G. Woodhouse himself had hordes of uncles and aunts. I think he had 15 uncles, and he, um, he was farmed out to a lot of them. He didn't see much of his parents in childhood, so he kind of takes revenge on all the uncles and aunts um, in his novels, uh, particularly the aunts. Um, aunts are always dangerous in one way or another in, um, uh, in his novels, and in Bertie Wooster's words, it's no use telling me that there are bad aunts and good aunts. At the core, they are all alike. Sooner or later, out pops the cloven hoof. Um, within the Woodhouse world, some of the um, characters are clearly obsessional and deranged, and some of them very na oh, regularly, narrowly escape the clutches of Sir Roderick Glossop, the loony doctor. Um, Uncle Lord Emsworth is obsessed with his flowers and then with his pig. As we know, Gussie Finknott is obsessive about his newts. Uncle Tom is obsessive in his behavior over his silver. Uh, Bingo Little is perpetually falling in love um, with the wrong girl until he meets Rosie M. Banks. And he, against all experience, he goes on and on relying on his dreams uh, to give him a guide on, on uh, betting on horses. Um, now, the, all, all of these um, behaviors, they're not just plot devices uh, for P.G. Woodhouse, but they're kind of fixed points in the, in the Woodhouse world. Um, and all the characters are very consistent um, in their obsessions. They always stay in character, and their relationships really never change. So Lord Emsworth is always a dreamer, and he's always harassed by his sisters and his efficient secretaries. Um, and when Smith disappears from his life, he's always rescued from his tormentors by his brother Galahad or by his equally raffish fellow Earl, the Earl of Ickenham. Uh, the Earl of Ickenham. And Bertie and his chums are always in some kind of soup um, from which they're always delivered by Jeeves, who's always omniscient and imperturbable. Bertie always yields to Jeeves on matters of clothing after a fight, but always yields. Uckridge is always trying to make money from dodgy schemes, and he always fails. Woodhouse girls are a sort of interesting a subset of characters, because they always fall into three types. Well, the ones that aren't just ciphers, that are just uh, there to be sundered hearts, to be reunited. Otherwise, you get three types of girls in P.G. Woodhouse's fiction. They're either hopelessly soppy, like Madeleine Bassett. They're impossibly intellectual, Honoria Glossop, Florence Cray. Or they're impossibly mischievous, Stiffy Bing, Pauline Stalker, Bobby Wickham. Just occasionally, P.G. Woodhouse um, relaxes his iron discipline. And I think my favorite story about Lord Emsworth is the one where he, he's let off the leash of being a dreamy peer. Uh, Lord Emsworth and the girlfriend. Um, he befriends a small girl from the working classes on a brief visit to Blandings. And for once, Lord Emsworth on his own, under the influence of protecting this little girl, faces down his stubborn Scots head gardener and even faces down his sister, Lady Constance. Um, but the real, what 
um, the real inconsistency in P.G. Woodhouse, having said, I've said that he's so consistent, P.G. Woodhouse is such a great stylist that he gets away with the, the fundamental contradiction in, PG, in um, Bertie Wooster. Now, <clears throat> officially, as you know, Bertie Wooster is a silly ass. Jeeves once memorably describes him as mentally neg negligible. Um, Bertie, Wooter, um, Bertie Wooster's only academic achievement is a prize at primary school for scripture knowledge. And even then, if you remember, Gussie Finknottle, when he delivers his famous um, speech when dead drunk at Market Snodsbury Grammar School, accuses Bertie of cheating. He says, if, if that Bertie Wooster didn't have a list of the kings of Judah and Israel as long as your arm up his sleeve, um, then I'm a lawyer. So that's, Bertie has no mental powers at all. But yet, Bertie is a terrific writer. He's a terrific natural narrator of all the stories. He regularly uses brilliant colorful metaphors. Um, Unchain the bacon and eggs, Jeeves. He employs very uh, inventive literary devices, particularly the one of um, referring to himself in the third person. It was a chastened Bertram Wooster you know, who returned up the steps of his flat. A far cry from the suave, debonair Bertrand Wooster, the boulevardier of, Boul of Piccadilly. Uh, he, uh, he regularly refers to things by their initials. I took a deep draft of the BNS. He's a master of um, the literary device called hypalage, transferred epithet. I lit a thoughtful cigarette. Um, He's a, he knows a great deal of quotations, at least dimly, and um, he uses a lot of literary allusions and snatches of foreign language, <clears throat> and even legal technicalities. Aunt Dahlia, I must enter a firm nolle prosequi, he says at one point. And um, that's... Um, P.G. Woodhouse gets away with making... Um, Bertie, a, a brilliant writer, and a silly ass at the same time. Um, and um, the, uh, Bertie himself describes himself at one point as a narrator, and this is sort of a little bit about, this tells you a little bit about Woodhouse himself and the, um, uh, the way his struggles, some, his occasional struggles over comp composition. Bertie just says, one point, at the start of Right Ho Jeeves. The snag I always come up against when I'm telling a story is this dashed, difficult problem of where to begin it. It's a thing you don't want to go wrong over because one false step and you're sunk. I mean, if you fool about too long at the start, trying to establish atmosphere, as they call it, and all that sort of rot, you fail to grip and the customers walk out on you. Get off the mark, on the other hand, like a scalded cat, and your public is at a loss. It simply raises its eyebrows and can't make out what you're talking about. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think um, B.G. Woodhouse always got, got this right as a narrator. Um, you enter the story, you enter the fantasy world um, gently but swiftly. Um, and you can stay with it um, as long as you like. Um, uh, I think I'll, um, I'll close there, except I'm going to ask you, um, I'm going to throw out a question. Yep, I'm going to throw out a question to you first. How many of you are familiar with uh, P.G. Woodhouse's favorite detective writer? Um, Rex Stout. Anybody familiar with Rex Stout? I'll just commend Rex Stout to you very briefly. Um, he established his main characters are a hugely fat detective called Nero Wolf and his assistant, his leg man called Archie Goodwin. And I'll just say very briefly, they have a relationship rather like Jeeves and Bertie, though Archie is much smarter than Bertie. Um, but um, 
Wolf is a little bit like um, like Jeeves, and in particular, he's a uses very. He's got a great brain, and he uses very orotund language. I'll give you an example of Wolf's language. Um, he refuses to end. Uh, <clears throat> He refuses to change his habits uh, at any time, and he once says, no, a schedule once interrupted at will becomes a mere procession of vagaries. Um, uh, I recommend um, uh, Rex Stout to you. And I just want to share one memory of a PG Woodhouse experience, my own, which you can go, you can recreate for yourselves. When I was at Oxford, we regularly used to ring up um, Harrods Gardening Department, uh, or any high-class gardening department of a department store, and you can ring up and put on a Bertie Woodhouse, a Bertie Wooster voice, and say, hello, I'm ringing up about the hoe. And the voice, the other end will be puzzled, and you just repeat this phrase over and over again. No, no, I'm ringing up about the hoe. I'm ringing up about the hoe. And eventually, the voice at the other end would say, what ho? And then you'd say, what ho? <laughs> and put the foot down, phone down. <coughs> That's it. Um, I hope you'll enjoy that Woodhouse experience. You, try that Woodhouse experience for yourself and enjoy it. Questions? Uh, we are taking some questions, but I'm going to uh, use my position as moderator here and ask a question before you. Um, actually, it's because uh, this year I had the pleasure of teaching a story of P.G. Woodhouse's called The Custody of the Pumpkin to my A-level students. And uh, we, of course, because we are doing it as literature, we analyzed it. And, uh, you know, you said that P.G. Woodhouse has created a fantasy world. But I would like to ask you if you have not... I mean, I would like to say that I think most of his work is social satire. Because, you know, you, you said there was a rare moment where he satirized that, um, I forget his name. Yeah. Oswald Mosley. That's right. Yeah. But uh, you see, we saw it as, uh, of course, it's very disguised, it's very gentle humor, it's great fun. But he is ruthlessly satirizing uh, English, the English social classes. I mean, the the aristocracy who's helpless, the servants who know more, who are even better spoken and better educated. Yes. You know, so I think there's a lot of uh, satire there on class consciousness and basically showing you how the aristocracy are pretty useless. I mean, they just raise pumpkins and pigs and... You know. that's, um, th that is, that's a very interesting take, Lynette, and I'd... Um, uh, I can understand that, and I think you can, you, if you want to, you can see a message. In, yes. in, you can certainly see that message in PG if you want to. Um, I think, uh, there's, as you know, there's quite a literary convention of helpless aristocrats, um, you know, being bailed out by their servants. Yes. Um, so PG is exploiting that convention, yes. uh, like the, uh, the admirable Crichton and so mm -hmm. on. <coughs> <coughs> Um, and um, um, some of the aristocrats, um, like the Earl of Ickenham, are actually very resourceful. They're almost like, they almost, um, they have the same sort of cunning as the servants um, uh, when they have to. And Smith is, a, a, is an aristocrat of a sort as well. So yes, they yes, can, he, doesn't can step, he doesn't stereotype. He doesn't stereotype. You can step but in and out. But he does. I mean, yeah. Bertie Wooster, even the name, the Drones Club. Yeah, the Drones is... <laughs> The drone, uh, quite right, a very suggestive <laughs> name. Yeah. But, it's a, but it's a badge of honor, yeah. you know, in a way, isn't it, in a way, too? You but, are a, but it's all in such good fun. It's, it's yeah. terrific fun, yeah. and you can, it's very true, you can take it, um, you can look deeper if you want to. Um, yeah. that's, I yeah. think that's, that's a profound point. You can yeah. take it on the surface and enjoy the, the sheer humor and the whimsy and the um, and style, or you can... You can look at it, but it, I don't think you would ever look at it as a realistic portrait of English life at the time, no, because no, that world no, had sort of vanished. No, it is a fantasy. That world, world had but, vanished uh, even when he was writing about it, yeah. even but, before the Great but War. But fantasy has always been used as satire. I mean, look at Gulliver's Travels and things like that. So That's, tr yeah. that's very true. So, yeah. 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 
She needs the mic. I just loved you reading these little bits and telling us all about it because P.G. Wodehouse has been such a favorite of mine through the ages of my uh, life. But the thing that I have a question about is the fact that you call it a fantasy world. Ah. Because truly, I thought, but please correct me, that a fantasy world had no reality at all like Harry Potter or like Gulliver's Travel. And yet, his the, the world that he creates is very much real, except that the characters are, have been taken to the extremes of stupidity or brainlessness or whatever it is. And uh, as you were explaining the characters, they sounded like sitcom characters because they were one-faceted and they remained that way all through. But the world in which they, are pop which they populate is not a fantasy world, it's real. Well, it's got, um, it's got real, pl yes, there are, there are real places. Bertie lives in, um, has a recognizable address, the drones um, landing, there are various places that might be Branding's castle. Um, the characters, um, I may have been, yes, I perhaps didn't mean to suggest that it's, it's not a Harry Potter world. It's not a, it's not, it's not a supernatural world. Let's put it that way. Um, it's, um, but it's a, um, I think it's a world created in which the characters can behave uh, in the way that they do. Um, it's not a world in which any of the characters, you know, have to make a living, have to restrain themselves by the conventions of the real world, if you like. Um, it's a, um, the, the, the world is a setting, you know, it's a setting for them, it's a stage, it's their, it's almost their plaything, is what I really meant to think. Yeah. What ho? <laughs> what ho? What ho? Um, just wanted to um, apologize for showing up late, I desperately wanted to be here on time. Uh, so I'm, apologies if I ask something that you've already addressed, but um, I, I would really like for you to comment on uh, Woodhouse's use of caricature. Because uh, I think that, uh, I mean, when I read, I feel a lot of similarity between Dickens and Woodhouse, except Woodhouse does it in a much more f fun manner. Um, and I think that, I mean, in taking up the, the fantasy point, I think that the fantasy world, I, didn't, I don't know if you've explained this, but uh, the, the elite, the rich, they live in their own fantasy, don't they? And they make caricatures of themselves. Um, and uh, just a following question. Have yeah. you met a Bertie Wooster or many in your life? Um, I've, I've, not met a, I've not met anybody, I've not met anybody who's lived like Bertie Wooster. I've not met anybody these days, and in my life even, in the 50s, there are, uh, I go back to the 50s, I've not met anybody who's been able to live like P.G. Woodhouse, uh, excuse, pardon me, like um, Bertie Wooster, and I've not, met anybody who has his own Jeeves, who has a pers gentleman's personal gentleman. Um, there are few stately homes where there may be a few Blanding's castles left, but not with that um, uh, degree of staff. I'm going to digress for a minute. Um, it's a lovely story about the Duke of Devonshire and Chatworth, owner of Chatsworth House in, in the Second World War. He was asked to reduce his domestic staff uh, to assist the war effort, and they're they're going through his, his staff, uh, the chaps who can be spared, and they come to French pastry cook. And the, and, and the Duke looks up indignantly and says, mayn't a chap have a biscuit? <laughs> but there are not many, <laughs> there are not many. <laughs> yeah, mayn't a chap have a biscuit? And uh, there are not many people, uh, there are not many people, live, there are maybe a few stately homes who live like that, though they mainly have to I've, I've played cricket at Highclere Castle, setting for Downton Abbey. And, um, you know, that has to sell itself commercially as a, as a, a film set and as a, um, as a conference center and that kind of thing. Um, sadly, the Earl of Emsworth would have to make a living these days in some way. 
But, uh, sorry, that was um, a digression. Where were we? But, uh, Caricature, Richard, just, the rich. Yes. One, one thing I'd like to say is, let's remember that his stories are being written in the 1930s. Yes. So, um, you know, maybe there were um, um, still then, a few yes. people. Yeah. Even then, there were people, perhaps realistically, a successful novelist like Rosie M. Banks. Um, yes. um, he writes the most appalling... Uh, Mills and Boone. Mills and Boone, yeah. to start with. But actually worse. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mervyn Thank Clean, you so Clubman. Um, Rosie Ann Banks would have still had a live-in servants. There were still, still people who had a, a live-in maid, um, maybe even a butler um, in suburban life, but not many. Okay. Um, thank you, Richard. Our time is up. Oh. So thank you so much. I think everyone enjoyed this session. I certainly did. Oh, thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you so you. much for being here. Uh, I'd like Thanks to announce that there's been a change. The event that was to be held here in the Halib Pavilion has been switched to the Kareem Pavilion, uh, Education Emergency. And the session that will be held here will be a 30-minute talk by Lieutenant Colonel Ian Vaughan Arbuckle, Life in Karachi During Ayub Khan's Reign. OK? Thank you so much, everyone. Because, uh, yeah. I mean,